Well, good morning, Oikos Church. We just want to praise God this morning. Today is Palm Sunday. If you didn't get your palms, I know mine are pretty excited over here because they want to, I mean, make a cross or braid it or, you know, just that reminder, right, that today Jesus came in and people were, you know, waving those palms, that sense of excitement. We all know how that feels, right? We love that sense of excitement. And so today, may you have a sense of excitement about worship. May you have a sense of excitement in that anticipation that God is good and he is good all the time. So we want to welcome you to Oikos. We pray that your time of worship is one where you experience his love, his grace, his mercy. Let's worship together as a family. Good morning, Oikos. Welcome to church this morning. This morning is Palm Sunday, so we sing Hosanna to praise the King who has come. So if you'll stand with me, we're going to start with some songs of praise and worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
Go ahead and take a seat as we get into our confession and absolution. I'm glad that you're here at Oikos. Welcome to our church. So we're going to celebrate this thing called Palm Sunday. This is, you know, one of the huge Sundays on in the Christian year, and it prepares us for Easter. So it's the beginning of Holy Week. But more importantly, Hosanna in the highest. You hear those words, Palm Sunday. You get imagery of Jesus walking and people celebrating that he had entered, that their king had arrived. And as I thought about that story, I want us to think a little bit about what happens when you repent. So Jesus told a parable. He said, what man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it. When he found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. When you think about the story of Palm Sunday, what I want you to think about is that when you repent, all of heaven is waiting for you to enter the presence of the Lord once again, to walk on that journey, to cheer over you. And all you're doing is saying, Lord, look in my heart. Reveal the things that I've done wrong. Show me the things I don't see. Restore me in the areas that I'm broken. And in that moment, all of heaven rejoices. You may be caught in a little bit of shame, but heaven is rejoicing. And that's what confession and absolution is about. It's reminding us that we don't get stuck in our sin or in our identity that wants to rebel against God. We're actually being invited into a journey of joy every time we repent. So let's take a moment. Let's reflect in that time. And I want some imagery to come to your mind as you're thinking about, oh, I failed here. Oh, I am continually rebellious here. I really messed up here. Lord, forgive me that in that moment, heaven is rejoicing. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you, and we have come into this week. It's a new week, Lord, and I pray that as we start this week, we can leave last week behind. We can give thanks for the ways that you showed up or in a more truthful way in the ways that we saw you show up. You're always there. You're always present. You're in our worst moments and our best moments. You're always there. But Lord, we give you thanks for those times that we recognized your presence this last week. We give you thanks for the provision that you've given us. We give you thanks for the things that we forget to give you thanks for, that we take for granted. And Lord, we confess those things that are heavy on our hearts. We hear your word. And when we hear it, we often feel very far from it. We're not the example that you may want us to be. Our thoughts are not very pure. Our words can be coercive and destructive. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us. And we believe that through your son's death and resurrection that you have. And so we repent. Lord, I pray that you would put that rejoicing in heaven in our ears.
and remind us that we have been given a new beginning, a new start. So as this week starts, let us walk through the crowds of heaven who are rejoicing as a sinner repents. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, if you have your palm, you've repented. So, can you say, Hosanna in the highest? Hosanna in the highest. Awesome. And say it again, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. The Lord who loves you, who is always with you. The Father who breathed life into his people. The Son who humbled himself and walked among his people. The Spirit who resides in you. The Lord who will never leave you or forsake you has given me this opportunity to tell you, I forgive you of all your sin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I love that. All right, at this time in our worship, we're going to go ahead and we're going to pray over our kids. So please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just say Hosanna today. Hosanna in the highest. We praise you, Lord, for being together today as a family. We praise you, Lord, for our children. We praise you, Lord, for the fact that today we get to engage in your word and we get to hear the story. And so, Lord, as the kids hear the story, may they be able to see how you are praised in it. And as we engage in the text, Lord, may they see the main story, the side story, and even the hidden story buried in there, Lord, for you to just reveal to them today. And so, Lord, watch over them, guide their steps, guide their feet as they walk into this week. May they see you in that glorious ride into Jerusalem. Hosanna, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Anybody else playing with there? Yeah, I know. It, it happens that way, so we're just going to hold on to it here for a bit. Um, I'm Rob, one of the pastors here. It's Palm Sunday. Good to be together. Um, we wrapped up First and Second Samuel last week, um, which actually is going to connect with our message today, and you can tell me where it's going to connect once we get there. Now, this morning, um, we had some text to look at, and I'm not going to focus on the uh, entry to Jerusalem side of it for the message, but I do want to read it just so we can hear it. That's what the kids, I'm sure, will spend some time with this morning. So this is uh, the reading, um, the telling of the entrance, the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem uh, from the book of Mark, chapter 11. So you can, you know, wave whenever you think it's appropriate. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, What are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and, he th and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut on the field just as the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God, or Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God, Hosanna, in the highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany, with the 12 disciples. That's the story. I'm sure you've heard that before. But what happens here is that Jesus is now in Jerusalem. He has entered Jerusalem as was foretold and as we have heard from the narrative. And then he spends some time in Jerusalem and Bethany in the area leading up to what we know is ahead of us with, with Holy Week. 
what I want us to do, and, and we can think through what the people that day, as Jesus was entering Jerusalem and, and they were waving Hosanna, it was Hosanna, praise God. I think what those who were pray, what they were saying and expecting is probably a little bit different than what Jesus intended to bring, at least that day, because they didn't have the whole picture quite yet like we do. What I want us to do, though, is I want us to jump ahead into Mark chapter 14. Hmm. Let's see if I get there. Mm-hmm. There we go. Chapter 14. You probably have it on the screen, but this is my phone catching up <laughs> slowly. Come on, you can do it. There we go. So just listen to this, and then we're going to talk about it. This will be on the screen for you to read along. Chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. It was now two days before Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The leading priests and the teachers of the religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for the burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when they heard why he had come, and they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. So maybe you noticed that in just these few verses here, there were two things that happened. One was the the leaders of the law plotting to secretly, in secret, to kill Jesus. And then at the end of the section, Judas Iscariot going to them and saying, I can help you, and they were happy to see that. And the plot began. In the middle is this interaction with Jesus and a few folks at the house of Simon, who was a former leper. Right, And as I read it, as <clears throat> Mark wrote it, it's just an ongoing thing during this period of time of Holy Week. And in fact, right after the section where I stopped begins the Last Supper. That is the time with Jesus in the upper room with his disciples, that close intimate time before he would depart them and end up crucified. So we have this interaction between, again, the plot to kill Jesus and then Judas helping them. And in the middle is this section. Let me read it again and just Think about what's happening here and what you are hearing and how we might first connect it to first and second Samuel. First and second Samuel, that right, we just came out of. And then we'll talk about how it might apply to what was happening in Mark's gospel and then maybe for us just a bit today. Okay? So I'm just going to read these middle verses here about Jesus. Meanwhile... Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume, or the oil, over his head. Some of those who are at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why criticize her for, what, for doing such a good thing to me? 
You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for a burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached, throughout the world this woman's deeds will be remembered and discussed. Now, that translation, I have to admit, uses perfume instead of oil, but Jesus talks about what she's doing is an anointing of him, right? So, any initial reflections or comments on what's happened here? Yeah, okay. So he's saying that that she's anointing him. And before we get to him, the anointing before his burial, which Jesus says directly in this text, where else have we talked about anointing in the last couple months? In First and Second Samuel. Who was anointed? King Saul and King David, right? I mean, so first, and we can take what Jesus is doing here, from what the woman anointing. Now, I know the text said perfume, but other translations would say oil. But think about what's going on here initially, is that in the context of those people gathered there, it would have been hard to miss what was occurring of someone coming into a room and anointing Jesus. And through an anointing that has been, become the practice of the believers and Jews, but even before that, an anointing of God upon King Saul and King David. Uh, we, we, we can't ignore the connection here. And as we're told, especially for David and for Samuel, that he was a man after God's own heart. And here is the one who is in the line, in the lineage of David, King David, who is being anointed. And as Jesus says, his body being anointed before his burial. Now, this isn't the first time in Mark's gospel that he talks about his death. But, nonetheless, it doesn't sound like the disciples that were in the room were much focused on this, were they? (laughs) No, not at all, right? So I think the first thing we can see is that there is an anointing occurring here in the true kingship of what they just proclaimed, Hosanna in the highest, right? Right? Hosanna, glory be to God, because the king is here. Jesus is here. That's what they're saying. And they're expecting him to go and overthrow Rome so the Jews are back in charge. That's what their expectation was. And what does Jesus say? As he's anointed, she's doing a good thing. She's preparing my body for burial. (laughs) I mean, we kind of, like, we're just accustomed to this. But this is so different than what have been expected at the time in that event that there's like there's just no way they even heard it for what Jesus said there's no way I mean I can imagine you know the weeks and months and years after that first holy week of looking back it's like yeah he did say that didn't he yeah, who was, were you, yeah, yeah, I was in there. I heard him say it. And we were, chastising, we were chastising that woman because she wasted the perfume instead of selling it to give to the poor. And our Savior is there telling us what's going to occur and giving honor and praise to this woman who anointed him king of all the universe ahead of his burial. More often than not, though, we probably would put ourselves in the same place that the disciples were in that room, probably a little distracted by what was going on, (laughs) probably a little distracted by expectations and how things look and what should be appropriate or not appropriate, right? Think about how they have already, those disciples of Jesus, have already heard about how Jesus talks about the poor, Though they don't have a full understanding, though they're in a house of Simon, who's a former leper, who suspect 
Jesus probably healed. All of those things are there. They're missing the fact of what's going on at that place at that time. They're more concerned about the value of the oil or the perfume they used and what that could have been used for because Jesus talks about the poor. They talk about this problem that they're facing that Jesus has said, this is what you should do and we should be doing that as opposed to the woman who shows up and is confronted with her Lord, her Messiah and has, for whatever reason, this abundance on some level Instead of a few drops, it's a jar of perfume, of oil, and chooses to take the entire content over the head of Jesus. I mean, what better response could have occurred from someone who has faith in Jesus? And yet his disciples, who have been with him for years, miss the entire point. Completely miss it. Jesus even goes to the extent of saying, what she has done here will be told about as the good news is spread throughout the world. I mean, I don't know how to take that, to be honest. How, how does like a seemingly just, you know, kind of innocuous kind of interaction and show up that Jesus would say that this is going to be told and shared wherever the good news goes throughout the world because, I mean, they don't know quite what's going on yet, but they will become witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right, as we're told in Acts. So Jesus knows this, and that's what he's saying. The good news is going to go out, and what she has done will be told about. I have to say, I've, I've preached on, you know, Holy Week, Palm Sunday here a few times. I've never ever even, I think, read this text before this year, because <laughs> we don't get to it. I mean, granted, it's not the Sunday, it's not the beginning of the week, it's midweek, and okay, I understand that. But there's something going on here that it's easy to skip over. What are you picking up on? Are you seeing yourself anywhere in the text? I'm not going to tell you where you should be, because that's not my answer to give. Is the Lord putting you somewhere? Is the Spirit there with you right now, kind of putting you in the text somewhere? There's not a right or wrong answer. I don't ask because there's a test here. I'm just curious. See, I've been sitting and thinking about where am I in this text. It's really hard, I'll be the first one to say, because the context, the setting, the situation, the life of those in, you know, 30-some-odd, you know, A.D. in Jerusalem, ahead of the festival, you know, during this period of time. We just can't relate to it. So let's just admit that first and foremost. We can't relate to it. The idea of having a perfume or, 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 or oil from the essence of nard, I mean, what is that? I don't even know what that is. I don't have it at my house, I know. So, I mean, it's just a very foreign, like, you know, context. That place and that time is just foreign to us. But even with all that, do you see yourself anywhere in there? Or, or if you don't see yourself in it, what's, what's jumping out at you about it? Tom, you have something? Judas uh, doesn't say anything specifically about him in yeah. the verse, but when they're talking about this could be used for the poor, wasn't he a treasurer? He was a treasurer. Hmm. And then right after there's hmm. the story of him going out. And plotting, yeah. So so you're blaming, it on, you're blaming it on Judas in the room is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, it's quite possible. I mean, it doesn't say if it is or isn't. I mean, so we can kind of make those assumptions. Yeah, I think the comment for those online is that, you know, we, Judas just after this goes off and to the, you know, the leaders of the law and he plots for some money to, to help them capture Jesus. Maybe he was the one that was thinking in financial terms in that room. Quite possibly, and none of, the, none of the others spoke up against him, though. So I'm going to say, even whether he said it or someone else said it, it probably was the general sentiment. Yeah, 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 that's fair. Yeah, looking at, even though, I mean, I think a year's wages, I mean, no matter what era you're living in, a year's wages is a lot, right? Whether it's today or it's back then, it's a year's wages. And so the value of that was very high, right? I think that's instructive. Hmm.
Yeah. But the context is that they're in a leper's home, so it's unclean. Mm. So it's not a place where you anoint a king. Right. It's a woman. Yeah. So it's not a prophet like Samuel. Yeah. It was one who was, he had to be the one. Mm. And then it's the, the context of where the disciples were, that they are unable to see Jesus as the provider. None of his miracles did he ever mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. Or we need a lot of money so we can make sure we house all these people. He was always saying it comes from me and only from me. Mm. And yet they were worried that this lard or nard. Nard, yeah. Nard. Not even lard. I know what lard is. Yeah, lard you get cooker. At least you get cooker that, but nard, exactly nard right. Yeah, yeah. It was going to be used in some way that they would not be able to get it back. Right, right. Hmm, okay. Uh, oh my gosh, how we're going to use these resources. Right. We won't get them back. Right. When maybe I just need to focus on loving Jesus. Hmm. Hmm. So then you always ask us, like, who's going to retell the story? Let me see if I can retell what you just shared, Pastor. Is that so? Aaron says, haven't read this, read this before, certainly in this period, in this context, but in the context of this, you're sitting in. A leper's home, a woman is anointing, um, the anointing is occurring uh, in a place that you never would have expected. It certainly as we looked at, at for Samuel, you have a prophet, you have you know, the leader, you have all kinds of things that are very expected for the occasion. This is anything but. And in that context, his disciples are more focused on the potential or the real value of this oil and perfume like they need to be worried about their resourcing because they're with though the great provider and never once in their time together with Jesus was he ever worried about resourcing from the standpoint of how we would right every time he provided so why would you be worried about the value of something to care for the poor the poor will be taken care of because Jesus has done it over and over and over again and not just the poor and physical or financial situations, but the poor in spirit, the broken and the downtrodden, which is there in the home of Simon the leper. So, I mean, it's like right there in, in the event. Is that most of what you said? Well, you left out the lard. And the lard, yeah. And that Aaron likes to cook with lard. No, no. Yeah, the nard. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So, yeah, and then, well, I'll stop there. Other, any other kind of reflections? Right. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So the reflection is that even in, well, in every situation he's there, and especially those that seem to be most challenged and dark and, and unhelpful and troubling and all the above, he's just there. So he's there, and everything was going on with, especially his disciples who had probably been with him and probably a little anxious about what's going to happen this week, right? Though they might not have understood it fully, they've been hearing what he's saying about death and the destruction of the temple and different things. So I'm sure they were probably a little bit, up, you know, uneased. Yeah. 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 Maybe those reflections are helping you to get into the text a bit more. Just breathe with me for a minute. <sighs> Spirit of God, just be present. Direct us in our reflections and our time together. Yeah, I think um, beautiful reflections. And we're still just probably just kind of scratching at the surface. But if you've heard of any of this be an expectation of how you should behave or respond to Jesus, just stop there. Right? I just, just let this, just let it be. 
You're in this moment, you're in this place here right now. You came in the door with this morning's activities and maybe this weekend and this past week's activities and whatever else is going on in your life. I'm inviting you to be, just be like right here, right now. And the breathing for me is to help me slow down my mind. The breathing for me is to focus on the breath and just be here and be present. All the things that were shared and what you heard from Mark's gospel, whatever they may be, and how the Lord, however the Lord's used them over that day in person with Jesus in the group and that week, and every time it's been told or shared or read, praise God for that. But we're here today. And I love the the pause, and even even though you might not have read that before this morning or heard it before this morning, some of these are reflections which are wonderful where I found myself wishing I would be in that text is the woman. Because I think what happened, we don't know why or how, but she shows up in this place probably looking for Jesus and she finds him. Who knows how she acquired the oil or the perfume, but she has it. And in that moment, all she's doing is she's doing what anyone would do if everything else was stripped away and forgotten for a moment and she was just there face to face with Jesus. Just giving him all praise and honor from a heart that is full of love because he first loved her. It's that simple. But I think it's that simple because she was there in that place at that time completely. I'm just going to say she was so overwhelmed, if you will, at the occasion that there's no way she thought about what happened the day before. (laughs) And there's no way she was worried about what was coming tomorrow. She was just there with Jesus. And for our benefit, she happened to have some oil, some perfume to anoint Jesus ahead of his burial, giving him the opportunity to say again what the king came to do. Why Palm Sunday was such a joyous event because the Son of God had come to sacrifice his life for all time and all place. Amen. And how better could you show that than in a leper's home, right, with someone that just shows up and anoints him just like King David would have been anointed, the one after God's own heart. Well, this is, in fact, God's own heart. I mean, this, I mean, God doesn't have a heart, but Jesus does. He was born of Mary. He is flesh and bone. His heart is beating in his heart, in his body. The heart of God is there. And she comes and anoints it. For the most holy of purposes, according to God's plan. I'm not her most days. (laughs) I'm not her because here's the rest of it, folks, for us. You have the same invitation. Do you realize that? Here's the reflection. And what I say is that I'm not telling you to walk around and go figure out what oil of nard is. I'm not saying that. Don't have a jar of perfume in your pocket. That's not my point. My point is that your presence with Jesus can be just the same because it's all about him coming first. We say this all the time. We say it all the time in here. Jesus is with you. He's in front of you, behind you, next to you, above you, but inside of you. There's nowhere in all of creation you can go that he is not. And to make it even more 
personal, the fact that God loves you so much every moment that your heart beats and you breathe, every moment is an affirmation of God's love for you. It's just that simple. You don't do it without him. I mean, just the basic stuff. You don't do it without him. The sun does not rise and the sun does not set without him. It does not rain without him. The air is not able to be breathed without him. You are not alive without him. It just, it just isn't. And not just you, but all time and all place and all of creation. That's just sustained by God's love for every single bit of it. Every bit. And of course, you are the most beloved in that setting and situation. You, you, every one of you, 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 you is incredibly unique because you, there's never been another you, and there never will be another you. And God knows that. That's why he so willingly sent his son to be here. That's how much he loves you. So what I think is that the woman here in the home gives us an opportunity to reflect on how that might work in our life. How might we practice being in the places wherever life takes us, whatever it is, being in those places in a way that we are aware that God Jesus is with us every moment. I mean, you can hold your breath for a bit, and you can't say, well, God gives you breath to breathe, but that only lasts for so long. Every time you take a breath should be a reminder that God loves you. He sustains you. Now, this isn't all theological. This is just if you, in any sort of a way, call in the name of Jesus with all the questions and baggage and hurt and pain and trauma and difficulty and suffering of this life, but you might think there's something about this that might just have a little bit of hope that you want to get a hold of. Amen. Jesus is there. He is never, ever not going to be there when you turn to him. He is always going to be there. And so what I found from this section of Mark's gospel so compelling is that the disciples who are with him all the time for three years, learning to be his student and to follow him and to follow him, she shows up and she is in that place at that time wholly with God, completely with Jesus, and does what anybody would do at that time in that setting with what she had. She anoints him. And he must have loved it. He must have loved it. Just like in our confession time today. Heaven rejoices. I don't know what that looks like. (laughs) I really don't. But I bet it's pretty good. (laughs) Maybe it's a bit like Jesus being anointed with some oil and perfume. I don't know. Heaven rejoices. And don't think of like repentance as this kind of big thing you got to come kneel at the church and whatever. No. Repentance is just admitting that God is with you. I mean, it, it could be as simple as wherever you are on Tuesday afternoon at 1245, you think, oh, thanks, Lord. I'm glad to be here with you. Amen. Heaven rejoices. That's all it is. And I bet. Well, I'm not like a betting man, but I'm pretty sure if you start doing that once in a while, you probably start doing it a few more times. You probably start doing it a bit more. And before long, you start realizing, oh, wait. So I'm going through my days and my weeks. My thoughts are with the Lord a bit more. I'm aware that he's with me. You probably slow down a little bit. You probably do this once in a while. (sighs) 
Thank you, Jesus. And in that moment, your mind slows down for just a touch. You stop thinking about the problems from yesterday. And you don't anticipate the problems for tomorrow. <laughs> and yeah, it's kind of simple stuff. I think, it's, I think that's kind of what we're talking about. I think we're talking about just being in that place where increasingly you're aware of how much God loves you. My reflections this week have been that I can get better. There you go, better, like there's some way of proving this. <laughs> For my own sake, I know I feel better. I know I'm, ha- I'm happy. I have, I have more joy. I just look at situations differently if I come into it with a different kind of posture, like, you know, emotion, like my spiritual and my mental and my physical postures, you know, just kind of there. There with Jesus. He's always there. Always there. I'm the one that needs to stay mindful of it. I'm the one that can practice a little more. And I'm the one that I have these seasons that it kind of feels like, oh, Jesus has been closer to me the last few days or something. And like it or not, sometimes that's when we experience the greatest joys because it kind of gets us out of our routine. It's like, oh, whatever it might be. I'm not sure what that last event was for you. Maybe it was some family event. Maybe it was a hike. Maybe it was it being at the beach. Maybe it was the weather. Maybe it was something that was just, just big enough out of your ordinary experience that you thought and paused for a minute and thought, wow, that was great. Or maybe it was the other side of it. Right? The bad news, the phone call, those low points that you don't anticipate. And you have nowhere else to go but to cry out to God because it hurts so much. The pain is too hard. See, those are the things that tend to get us for a moment more aware of who God is in our life. Right? Because the li- life is full of the routine. And don't hear the routine as being bad. He's saying that life is full of the routine. So then we get these glimpses of the mountain peak or the valley, figuratively speaking. Those are the times that remind us of, oh yeah, thank you Jesus. I don't know what it is for you today, what it was last week. This week is Holy Week. This week today we celebrate Jesus entering Jerusalem. Monday, Thursday, we'll have a gathering. Good Friday, we'll have a gathering. Whether you're here or not, it's an occasion just to stop and pause. Next week is Easter. Next week is the Easter that we will celebrate. Jesus talking about being anointed before his burial, and we will celebrate his resurrection. His resurrection, which then he is the first fruit, which we all look forward to. But we don't have to wait for our resurrection to enjoy it. We can take the good gift of Jesus' resurrection and his victory and bring it to us today. And that's the gift. However it shows up for you, I invite you just to think about it. I pray that the Lord's Spirit will just nudge you a little bit this week. And maybe, maybe once or twice, you'll do this. And just slow down that thought process that can get out of control. (laughs) Amen? It's the fourth Sunday of the month today. And on the fourth Sunday, we have some time for healing prayer. So we're going to go into that now. Aaron and I will be up here. And if if you want a prayer, someone to pray with you, wonderful. If you want to stay where you are and just talk with the Lord, amen. Whatever, whatever you feel like you're thinking this morning, embrace it. Jesus is here. He's with you. He's with me. He's next to you, behind you. He's sitting in the chair. Whatever it is, whatever the image you need, he's there. Have a chat with him. However that shows up, we're going to take some time 
uh, for healing prayer, and then we'll join together in the family prayer. Certainly you can continue your prayers with the Lord. He'd like that. Let's join together in the family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to move into the Lord's Supper now. So as we prepare our hearts for the, the gift of the Lord's Supper, we say the Apostles' Creed together to remind us of who we believe in. So please join me. Oh, we don't have that on the screen. Oh, hey. Well, you know what? So since we don't have that on the screen, and since I normally mess it up, um, we're going to pass the Apostles' Creed. I'm just such in a, a great pastor right now. But as we get ready for the Lord's Supper, hear the words of the institution, because this is part of what Jesus said. And the reason why we repeat these words is because this is what Jesus said to his disciples. And then later, after Jesus rose again and ascended into heaven, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote about it again in 1 Corinthians, saying this is how you should do the Lord's Supper. So we've taken those words from Christ, and we repeat them to remind us that we are under the authority of Jesus. We're under his power. And when we do the things that he does, we receive a blessing. And one of the things of the Lord's Supper that you receive is forgiveness of sins, restoration of faith, and life everlasting. So as we celebrate this Lord's Supper, if you're a baptized Christian and you believe in these things, then we ask you to participate. If you're unsure about that, then have a conversation with us so we can explain more about what the Lord is doing in this special meal. So on the night that he's betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, and he gave it thanks, giving it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. After he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper, you can come as you are ready. We'll go through. We have a common cup and we have individual cups. You'll receive the bread. If you are not receiving but you would like to receive a blessing, you can come up and just indicate that you're not receiving and we'll give you a blessing instead. For our children who have not prepared for the Lord's Supper, they can come up and receive a blessing as well. This is a time for you to think about how much Jesus loves you, how very present he is, and how he will touch you personally as you participate in the meal that he gave us. So welcome. Welcome to his table.
So may this true body and true blood strengthen you and preserve you in true faith until Jesus comes again. Depart in peace. Amen. So just a couple of announcements before we close. Again, we have Monday, Thursday, 7 o'clock. Monday, Thursday is going to be kind of what we do for Sunday brunch, only minus we're not really bringing food. So we're doing a little bit of story time. We're going to reflect on it. We're going to have some prayer time, and we're celebrating the Lord's Supper because that is when it was instituted was on that Monday, Thursday. Then Good Friday is a real observation and reflection time. You're going to hear the story of Jesus 
his journey to the cross. It's a time for us to reflect that it's without the cross, Easter means nothing. And the same thing is true with Easter or with the cross, is that without Easter, the cross means nothing. So these two days are really important as a Christian. So we come on Good Friday, 7 o'clock. We'll walk through the journey of Jesus stepping towards the cross and being crucified. Then Sunday morning, we will be back here at 10 o'clock to celebrate Easter. Again, this is a great day to invite family who have been away for a while. This is a great day to invite friends who are like, well, you know, I, I kind of go to church, but they never really go. It's a good day to remind people it's a good thing to come together as people. I love it. I love that I get to see people who I don't get to see during the week. And quite honestly, if we didn't come here, I don't know if I would see you. It's a blessing that the Lord has put us together for whatever reason. And I love that. I want other people to experience that same community and love because there are a lot of lonely people who are going through this life with no connection to others or to Jesus. So, Sunday morning, if you didn't hear it, it's a good time to invite for people to come. We're going to have a little surprise for you, but I'm going to blow the surprise because I'm going to tell you so you're aware. We're moving a little bit in the process of what we're going to be as we assemble. We're going to change things a little bit. What I've observed is that we have great conversation when we have the Sunday brunch and we have tables. I've observed that people come in and they enjoy sitting at a table. Now, you may not be one of those people, so you can send me an email later. But on Sunday morning, we'll have tables. And we will begin that process of every Sunday we'll have tables. That does not mean we'll always have Sunday brunch. But we're going to be interacting around tables, shifting things from rows of chairs. So... If you are you feeling the Lord saying, I really hate that idea, then I would love to hear you. If you are hearing the Lord go, oh, I love that idea, you don't have to tell me. That's okay, because it's going to happen. So, I love you all, and I love to hear comments, even if you think I don't. Because we are a family, and I love to have that com communication of how can we become better? How can we be a place where people learn about Jesus even more so? How can we be a place where people are discipled? How can we be a place where the love of the woman that we heard about is expressed at least weekly here in this place? The Lord loves you. His light shines upon you. He lives with you inward and outward. He knows you intimately he loves you so much that you can't out love him and he'll go with you this week so watch for him in the name of the father son and the holy spirit amen